This is Coda Radio, episode 35, for February 4th, 2013. You're listening to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. My name is Michael Dominic, and I'm a hot wing addict. And uh, we're just going to uh, just help you maintain. We're not going to judge. We're, <laughs> we'll supply you with a, with a small little uh, hot wing stipend that you can just keep buying them on the side. We won't tell anybody, and we'll just move on. We don't have to make a well, big deal out of this. Well, you know, they have clinics now where they give you uh, uh, tofu hot wings and kind of wean you off to help you through the, you know, the addiction. Well, and you're not, you know, you're not alone because uh, Aaron Burnett from CNN. I love chicken. She loves chicken, but, you know, I got to tell you. I eat too much chicken. So she's cutting back. Well, it, you know, it's really a, a, a devastating uh, phenomenon in this country. <laughs> This is why people need to tune in live. See, Coda Radio is live on Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern over jblive.tv and jblive.info for audio. And uh, you might you might have guessed there was a little bit of a hot wing discussion before we went <laughs> before we started recording. <laughs> Just a bit. Now, kids, you know, don't do chicken. Right. Yeah. Just stay clean. You know, if your friend or offers you some honey barbecue chicken sandwiches or maybe a Jack Daniels chicken sandwich, just say no. You know, it's a gateway. It's a gateway meat, and the next thing you know, you're eating more and more chicken, and then you're eating too much chicken. And then what are you going to do? Then we have a chicken wing shortage when the uh, Super Bowl hits, and and then, uh, and then you have to, you know, admit your addiction on CNN, apparently. Right. So what are we talking about today besides chicken? We are talking about the end of things, which makes me feel like we wasted last week's title. I think you're just kind of in the mood of like seeing some things come to an end. Well, it's not me. So oh, uh, okay. Because it kind of seemed like it might have been. A lot of folks in the tech se- sector seem to be just dropping the guillotine on projects right now. Oh, yeah, sure. I've seen that. Uh, the biggest one and I is going to be X and A, which we'll talk about when we actually get to that portion of the show. Mm-hmm. Now, it's been a long time coming, but it's, it's still sad, right? And there's some interesting implications for the future of those developers. Yeah, okay. Stay tuned. Yeah. But first, the feedback, which I have boiled down to only four questions this week. Wow. Because I messed up my inbox. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know that. I know about that. I've actually found I, I have I, I've kind of given up on filters because yeah. after a while they kind of break down and then stuff. I, I miss stuff. But now I have like some filters still applied. It's just a disaster. Well, I tried to um, make my spam filter, also known as Darth Maul, mm. kind of relax. Mm. Yeah, that didn't work. Then I'm Darth Maul sure. and break and see what happens. The rebels, the rebels come back stronger than ever. Well, in my case, it was the uh, Wow Gold Sellers came back stronger than ever, <laughs> so I had to go with the nuclear option on my email. But oh, wow. that's that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what did what survived uh, the fallout? So Mark wrote in. He writes, "In your honest and sometimes brutal opinion, hey, brutal? Are we brutal? Are we like Vikings here? Hmm. Love Vikings, Nordic folk. We're courageous. I can tell you that. I feel pretty courageous today." I feel courageous. I feel yeah. like I'm on a long boat. Yeah, I, I told so him. He, he writes, in your honest and sometimes brutal, brutal opinion, which language should prevail? He's asking about Ruby versus Python. Now, he's developing on Windows with a focus on Win32 comp. Uh, he says support SES modules. We're just going to call it modules to make my life easy. All the machines at his work are running Windows 7. Not surprising. He personally runs a MacBook Pro with Mountain Lion, and he's dual boot booting Ubuntu LTS 12.04. Okay, so I believe, and I'm not 100% sure, but I believe Python has a bit more support on the Windows side than Ruby. In fact, I know that for a fact. So if your target audience are uh, Windows users, Python is going to be the passive least resistance. So again, if you, if you prefer Ruby, go with that, but... Hmm. If you really just if it's this is work and you need to get this done fast and easy, just do it in Python. I'm assuming you're doing some kind of GUI module, or even if it's not, Windows does have a bit more support for Python. Uh, 
the chat's correctly mentioning Iron Python, which is kind of pseudo abandoned by Microsoft right now. But you don't even need to use Iron Python. But he's asking I mean, you for your brutal opinion. This sounds like a well, you know, this is your best. This is your best option. You don't sound like you're really behind this recommendation. Oh, do I do I need to lay the hammer down? Well, you, no. You just kind of sound like you're kind of like ah. I guess you got to use Python, but you almost sound like you well, want to say Ruby. No, I don't want to say Ruby. You almost sound um, like in fact, it. In fact, we should talk about this in the hoopla because I forgot to make a note of it. I've moved almost totally away from uh, Rails due to some horrible stuff that you've probably heard about on TechSnap. Oh, yes, yes. That's, but that has nothing to do with Ruby itself. Cool. So, Chris, it really comes down to on Windows, Python is just much more supported. There's a stronger Python community on Windows. Mm. Yeah, that could, that's Windows, a big advantage. Why why take the harder rat, right, route? Right. Now, the advantage of Iron Python is that it compiles to the CLR. Not gonna go into a detail on what the CLR is. Um We have a couple of people. We got uh Bear and Totally Mike in the chat room are pretty positive on Ruby on Windows. They say it's uh, great. File calls even fix backslashes. Um Totally Mike says it's easy to set up, but I think you're not just talking about like getting it installed, you're actually talking about the community around it as well right you're talking about like yeah the yeah i guess i guess we should resources clarify. you can install any language on any machine I and mean, it's, it's not hard especially windows <laughs> everybody yeah, makes it, something for windows. in fact i think for ruby i'm pretty sure there's an msi executable or, or an old xe executable it's adorable it is adorable I, lo I love those new msi ones they're quite snazzy oh yeah oh yeah well you know what's great about msi a lot of in a lot of cases you can deploy them across an entire network if you have Active Directory and Group Policy, so you can take something as an MSI and just install it across your entire network. It's pretty cool. Very nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, so it, to me, the big advantage is that the Python community on Windows is a bit stronger just because of Iron Python. But if it, it may come down to what you do, I mean, if there's a Ruby gem that's going to be, you know a way to, for you to save a lot of time and work, then go ahead and use Ruby because, of course, the gem system is pretty powerful. He didn't really, he didn't say, like, what he already has the most experience in. He's been playing with both. So he's a, he's relatively new to both. So it's not like he has 10 years of Ruby and giving it up would be ah, pain. So he's kind of saying, help me decide which one I should just totally yeah. put the pedal to the metal to and just commit myself. I mean, it, the only thing is that, he, you know, he's a Mac user, but he's supporting Windows folks it's a little strange, but I. I what's the I What's the Python story on OS ten? Uh, same as it is everywhere else. Oh, actually, it's built in. So now, and and he also dual boots Ubuntu. We know the we know the pi we know that the uh, the way with the Python is strong there. So, oh my God, they're they're channeling the Snake God. Yes. Right. So now, so, so you're, you're telling me you've got you've got a large community for Windows. You've got built in support on OS ten and Ubuntu, and those are all the three platforms that he's using. Yeah, I mean, if he wants to go the Iron Python route, it might make sense to boot up a Windows VM and work in there, because uh, there's a lot of Visual Studio tie-ins and some mm. little benefits he right. can get. Right. But even if he just wants to go, you know, quote straight Python, and the other advantage to Python would be, you know, it's very batteries included. Whereas Ruby, you're going to have to look for gems and listen to TechSnap for some recent security issues. <laughs> you know, one thing about the gem system, it's awesome, but you have to trust the person giving you the gem. Hmm. I mean, again, with, with any open source, yeah. you have to trust the person. But it's since nice Ruby's, if it comes built in. You kind of, you know, you know, you can trust it. Yeah, and Ruby is kind of a, a little more the base language, and then you plug in your gems as needed. Or I feel like Python. Well, it, this is a fact. Python's designed to be batteries included. So I guess I'd say Python, but it's not as brutal as he was hoping. Yeah, I think he was yeah. expecting a little. Yeah, maybe actually, I think maybe he was expecting you to come down on 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 Python and say that's crap. Go Ruby. <laughs> I don't know. I was expecting well, a little spark. When though. we get to the hoopla, you'll be surprised what language I've uh, oh. switched to from Ruby. Okay. Okay. All right. But uh, Tushar writes in, since neither Apple nor Google require you to release the source code of your app when you submit it for the App Store approval processes, you could hide stuff that activates them. Okay, so. Kind of I mean, activates once will, the customer installs. Yeah, it kind of so he's. He, I, I truncated this email because it uh, came off as a little evil. I'm sure too sure you're a nice guy. Uh, no, no, you can't. I mean, you can, but it won't work. So, Google has something called the bouncer, if I remember. This was a big story about four months ago, Chris. Okay, yeah. Do they call it the bouncer? Or, it's not called gatekeeper. That's Apple's thing. Um, Are you talking about the thing that they can use to revoke an app remotely? 
It, no, it's called remember that they have that automatic malware scanner that's been revoked. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. that is what I'm talking yep, about. Yep, yep. I'm looking at an article right now. It's called Bouncer. Bouncer. So here's the difference. Apple does it up front when you submit the app. They scan your binary. So I'll give you a great example of ways to get rejected from the App Store. There is an old call on Coco called UI Get Screenshot. Hmm. It's a C. It's a C command because remember, Objective C is just a pure superset of C. So anything in C works. They can scan your your binary to see if you're making that specific call, and they will reject you because it's deprecated. How do, so? Okay, so they since. Since in order for you to do anything, you have to make a specific call in the OS, they can then just capture every call the app makes. and then There determine- are specific calls that are forbidden that they're checking for. Okay. Now, they do analyze your binary, and they have gotten very sophisticated. People, you know, you're not the first person with this idea. <laughs> and they have a very big incentive, both Apple and Google. Now, Google does it a little differently, right? They scan them as they're in the store. They don't do them on you know, they don't stall them from getting in and do it that way. But essentially, there is some scanning, and even if you get away with it, you won't last very long. Uh, especially, I mean, Google, I think if you read any of the tech press, Google's trying to step up their security game. So, and after, but yeah. but it is possible, technically. At least it's on the Google side. It's easier on Android, yeah. but it's... It, it's this, this would be, though, so this is kind of... This is kind of a straw man argument in the sense that this would be the case for any proprietary application on any well, this, platform. doesn't matter if yeah, it goes through an app store. Any, even if it's not proprietary, yeah. if you're just submitting a binary. Well, true. I mean, an open source yeah. app could do this and I would never know because I don't check the code before I run it. Right. So this isn't really an, an Apple Google problem. No. Google's policies make it a little easier, but you know, this, this is installed from trusted sources and trusted developers problem. Yeah. And that's why, First of all, it's not a great idea, right? To have either of these accounts to be able to submit apps, you have to register. And, you know, in the case of Apple, it's actually kind of a pain. You have to give them a lot of documentation. Tied to, you know, identifiable information. A corporation or a person. So, yeah, I don't think this is a great idea. Um, And I'm assuming Tushar is asking for research purposes. Hmm. Well, I mean, we've seen examples, but usually by the time we hear about them, it's because they've been pulled. Yeah, I mean, they've been pulled and... You know, I'll give an example. I'll give you a kind of... This is, again, it wouldn't matter if it was open source or not, but I installed like a a, a Star Trek wallpaper app on my Android device or something like that to get like a live... To make it look like Elkars because I wanted to be a nerd and make it a tab right. or whatever, pad. Uh, and it ended up just installing a ton of junk and in, installing notifi- you know, notification banners and, and, and just all kinds of stuff. And... Um, I guess you could kind of consider that to be I expected one functionality and after it was installed it, it executed something else completely different. Um, and you know that's right. still in the Android store. Well, I mean, you, it's not to say this isn't possible. It's just that if anyone's, you know, hip enough to report it. Yeah, I mean, I went there and gave it a, you know, a bad review and all that. Yeah, I mean, this is I mean, mobile malware is going to be a problem and it already is a problem. More so on Android because of the way it's done, but I don't, you know, this is not an area where I would encourage people to focus their attention, I guess is how I would put this. Okay. But because it's hard and because you take your time to build something productive. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. you know, not if you don't just be a tool. Don't like, do it. Don't do yeah. it. No. Okay. So, Michael, not me. Writes and suggesting that the Ubuntu phone is not targeted at the U.S. market. That's a good point that we probably should. So he's a few episodes back, Chris. Yeah. Uh, he's responding to our Ubuntu phone episode. Yeah, so it is probably a, uh, what's the term they use? Developing nations play? Yeah. Yeah. I think at least initially, uh, and I think they've kind of said this. So the I think they actually said that in one of the press conferences. Like too, the, you know, they, when they say yeah. it'll be shipping in early 2014, that's yeah. going to be the developing nation phone. Okay, that's going to be not even. Yeah, it's 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 really not even Europe. It's, so it's it's yeah. It's good. That's going to be no app store. That's going to be yeah. uh, you know uh, pretty limited in in feature scope. Then in the second half or later half, I guess they haven't really been clear. In 2014, they're supposed to have the super phone model, which will give you the you dock it, and then you also get Android. Or, I'm sorry, you get uh, the Ubuntu desktop. It's sure. going to have more powerful features. That's the one they want to target at the high end enterprise market, which I would assume would be more like you know. U.S. and Europe and Australia. Yeah, I mean, my position on this whole thing is still where it was, right? I think it's worth discussing again when we can actually touch a phone. 
and where somebody can actually touch yeah, a phone. Yeah, and we're supposed to get yeah. images towards the end of this month. And uh, I have my Galaxy Nexus right here, ready. I'll, you'll I'm, be our, uh, I'm going to wipe our... it. Yeah, I've got, right. I've got, uh, I've got stock Android on here right now. But uh, I'll go to. Uh, I'm curious to see if the battery life's better because I tell you the battery life really sucks on my Galaxy Nexus. I doubt that. But okay. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I guess it's you know it could be an interesting play. I hope it could, turns out well again. But you know, really, it, it, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. You, Maybe we can't really make uh, uh, an indicator out of this, but I, I'm going to watch how BlackBerry 10 does. And if BlackBerry 10 sees some success, I don't know if that's good or bad for Ubuntu, but at least it proves that another player can move in. Probably now, does it mean it takes any Ubuntu. remaining air out of the room? Does it does it remove all remaining air? I don't well, know. Well, that's, that that uh, no, so that's a great segue thing? into the Dev World 2. I so, how I did that. May God rest research in motion soul. They no longer exist. They are now called BlackBerry. Womp, womp. Yeah, you know, I don't mind that. That's okay. That makes a lot of sense to me, actually. Yeah. Uh, so BlackBerry 10 is out. There's a bunch of reviews around. The reason I'm talking about this, a lot of people emailed and asking about it or messaged me on Google+. Plus. We've already had people stop by in the chat room this morning uh, during yeah. the pre-show asking about it, too. So it, it, it's very popular with a certain set of the audience, which is great. And I know actually our own, I think Nathan PC was uh, has an app on here now, doesn't he? I think so. Or at least yes. I know he was uh, in process. I don't I don't know what happened. I don't know if he's live yet, but maybe I just ruined his launch. Oh. Well, Nathan PC, let us know because he's here. If you're here, tell us the name. We'll plug it. He's here. Okay. Oh, yeah. To put it, tell us the name in the chat room. So it, it looks nice. Um, you know, from a developer perspective, I'm not sure that I would once again split resources. Because, you know, it... Right at this point, yeah. you're 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 confident on Android and iOS. Now yeah. you're thinking, Windows Mobile or BlackBerry Ten, right? Uh, yeah, and so BlackBerry Ten also the application numbers are a bit inflated because it has that weird gingerbread emulator. Oh, they are using that. They are using that. Huh. So yeah, it's you know one of the things if you read some of the reviews, the apps that are Android apps don't look native at all and as you might expect they feel like android and it's very disconcerting like very out of place i thought i heard too that uh i i can't remember but i thought i heard that in in one of their super bowl commercials they said something like you don't need all those distracting apps on your smartphone uh you, you know uh, because we have all that stuff built in basically my these grapes are sour Basically, they were saying yeah. something like, well, we don't have a ton of apps, but apps are a distraction. You don't need those. So they've done some interesting things with their unified inbox and the way they handle notifications. I don't know that that will be enough to recapture a significant portion of the marker where developers... Interesting, too, to see Ubuntu phone come in with that. It's sort of a, almost an exact similar sort they're of very unified similar. And they're, and they're And you notice and really that BlackBerry 10 appears to use a lot of gestures, too. Right, and they're both targeted towards enterprise. Uh, Cherry Notes with, oh yeah, so this is a great idea. Notes, anytime you have a Notes app with Dropbox integration and you're in the store early like this, I think this is going to do well for them. Uh, and it looks really good too, although the screenshot won't get bigger. But So there you go, folks. Cherry Notes, that's Nathan PC. He's a longtime viewer of the show. And uh, it's 99 cents in the in the BlackBerry world if you've got yes. yourself one of these new devices. Nathan, okay. boldly going where I just won't. Congratulations, Nathan. So, yeah, I mean, back to what your point was, though, is I think at this point you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, if I'm going to branch out and probably, I don't know, I would I would probably bet on Windows Phone over BlackBerry at this point. If I could. I feel like Microsoft, if they need to, can buy market share. They could literally buy, buy BlackBerry. Well, or they could just, you know, make strange enterprise licensing deals to, you know, everybody in your corporation gets a Windows Phone. I mean, and not to go crazy here, but... Yeah. Uh, they they are talking about putting a stake in Dell. Um, Microsoft might start doing this. Yeah, that's a, that's a strange story, isn't it? Dell's well, trying to. So for those who don't know, Dell's trying to no longer be a publicly traded company. Right, and micro. I think the rumor was that Microsoft might twenty twenty two percent stake in Dell, something like that. And uh, when they go private, so you got to wonder, Microsoft. Remember, they've they've said they've changed to a devices company, a devices and services company. The largest software maker in the world, the richest software company in the history of mankind, is says they're becoming a devices and services company, and maybe they might, maybe a company like BlackBerry might be very attractive to them. 
I would be very surprised. Yeah. Yeah. But still, I mean, it, it you know, disregarding all the, the market competition, it is a very attractive looking operating system. And it's not to say that it, there won't be some opportunity for developers, right? I mean, there are still tons of businesses, tons of government type organizations that are solely BlackBerry. I shouldn't say tons, but there's a number of them. Yeah, I just don't feel like I, I feel like that's saying that there's tons and tons of corporations that run DOS, and while Windows has some nice features, uh, you know, there's so many programs that are still DOS based that I don't see a lot of people switching. I feel wow. I feel like that was the same. Well, no, honestly, it's just because I was involved in that conversation back during that period, and this is how it sounded to me. And it because what it seems like is it just doesn't seem like it seems like oh well, there's you know we have plenty of momentum and, and adoption already over here, but. The honest truth is, is that not only is there sort of just this natural employee bring your own device trend that really is happening, even even now beginning at the government level, which would never have happened, you know, years ago. That was just no, you know, but, you know, they told you what you got, and I just feel like every new blood they bring into the company is just one more person who has that mentality, and over time, it just the 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 world just moves on. And the main the the, the main feature that BlackBerry really had was the BlackBerry Enterprise Server Bez. BlackBerry Enterprise Server, which was incredibly expensive for a very long time until they really started getting their asses kicked in the industry uh, because Microsoft rolled out ActiveSync, and ActiveSync does just about everything Bez does, and honestly, ActiveSync is cheaper if you already have Exchange, and ActiveSync has some other great features too. Now, yes, BlackBerry has some advantages, and there's some really cool micromanagement, big brother type monitoring you can do with BlackBerry devices that you can't do with some of the other platforms, but I don't think people really have an interest in it anymore because the other ones do it good enough. The iPhone, Android, they all can do ActiveSync. Chris, if I could give you a BlackBerry phone and Big Brother monitor everything you do, I'd do it. I mean, literally, I've had clients where they have the uh, BlackBerry Enterprise Server store a copy of every single text message that the employees send. Even yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, stuff. The, the, the BlackBerry, a lot of the BlackBerry users, even the ones I talk to who are in the IT space, are more than a little paranoid, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're, if you ask them, why, why are you still on BlackBerry, it's always security. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. so I mean I wish them well um, and if anyone's developing anything on BB10 I'd love to hear about it uh, I know Nathan has uh, the Cherry Note app which is great so yeah just to, if you want to write in with your development experiences that would be you know honestly I'd rather RIM get the uh, the market share than, than Windows Phone I think um, I think Microsoft we've seen what Microsoft does when they get the uh, dominant enterprise share and I'm not very impressed yeah see, see the whole perversion of Android thing. I wish they hadn't done that. Because it, I feel like they're hurting Android and BB10. Who is? By having that. Who, what? Uh, Blackberry. Oh, tell me why. So they what I've been reading is that the Android apps don't quite run very well. And it's just a strange situation to say we're going to emulate this other mobile operating system on our mobile operating system. Right, right. Um, uh, it, it's, is that because, but yeah, I guess so. But I mean, am I misunderstanding that aren't the apps running on Android already kind of running in a runtime anyways? So moving them over to another runtime is while the UI elements don't look the same, there isn't the app kind of still running in the, at the same virtualized level in some sense. So yeah, right. Android apps run, to, run in the, uh, the Davlik virtual machine, right. Dalvik, I'm sorry. Yeah. But that doesn't, okay. Let's, let's even say there's not bugging this, Right. And let's pretend like you don't have to specifically test your app for the BB10 emulator, which is not true. But let's just give them that. The apps are still a poorer experience than the native BB10 apps. And I feel like that's a compromise that shows weakness. Hmm. Yeah, I do agree there. Right? BlackBerry is not doing great. But, you know, they're not... I mean, they're not in Chapter 11, right? They could push developers to, to develop for them. And they have been, and, you know... I'm sure a lot of developers get emails from them. But they're pushing, but they're not quite pushing that hard, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, they're they're yeah. well, I, I don't know if they do have the guns to back up. I mean I don't I mean they don't have they don't have big cash reservoirs, aren't they? Even talking about selling their office building and leasing it back. I mean, Sony just did that, right? They just yeah. sold their yeah. headquarters in New York, but or Tokyo. Where was it? New York or Tokyo? Which one did they sell? I'm not sure, but I know it was one of them. Sure. Yeah. 
Right. But remember, the, the kind of cash they would need to, I hate to say bribe, but bribe developers isn't significant in a big picture big picture sense. Right. They could cut a few $10,000 checks or a few $20,000 yeah. checks or what? Even less. Yeah. I mean, AAA, you know, top tier developers are going to want more than $10,000. Sure. Yeah. But if they just, they could present an opportunity for mid to, to even lower tier developers to say, listen, you could be top tier on this platform where your competitors aren't, you know, that $10,000 check would go a long way. But, uh, there's reasons not to do that, right? That's a lot of risk for them. Because it's easy to, you know, like Microsoft throws money at Rovio to develop Angry Birds. And, you know, there's rumors that they did the same thing with Spotify. Mm -hmm. Easy to back those two because they're winners and they're known winners. Yeah. A little harder to back the guy who's doing okay. Right. So I guess I would have liked, you know, BlackBerry. You know, they're the underdog. Why not? back the underdog devs. I'll tell you one thing they did right, though, is hardware is, like, available almost immediately or very soon, right? Like, this is going to be something consumers can actually go out and buy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can order it, if not now, next week or something. You know, that's it's, how it's, you do it. That's how yeah. you do it. And that's that's really important. If you get any kind of buzz, capitalize on that. And I know it's so hard on, like, a execution level and having a product ready and the inventory and in the stores and then making I mean, this announcement. I know that's all tough, but it really seems to work. And to be fair, the reviews of this haven't been bad. The problem is that each review has been ending with, oh, but iOS and Android exist. Mm -hmm. So you're unlikely to switch. Well, isn't that how every Linux desktop review had to end and has ended forever? Well, Back and Windows still exists. Yeah. yeah. But let's, let's get off of this. I mean, I think we're a little too much onto consumer electronics here. Let's just okay. drop it. But to it, talk it, about the next consumer electronic release. I just want to say before we go, uh, I think we have seen more interest in our audience than I expected for BlackBerry 10. And uh, whatever they have done there, they've done right because, you know, like Nathan PC in our chat rooms already got an app in there. So they, they must be engaging at some level with developers. Maybe they're not engaging at the level you'd like to see, but they're doing something right. Well, I also think, you know, yeah, they are engaging and they, they are offering support. Like you could have signed up and gotten a free device. That's cool. Uh, I don't know if how, how long ago that was, but. So they are doing some of what they need to do, and they've certainly got a eager developer community, which is, is great. See, well, and the other thing we got to remember is that BlackBerry, gosh, it's weird to call them that now and not be... Yeah. But uh, anyways, uh, they've been in this this phone market, the, the mobile industry, for a long time. They probably know how to play the game a lot better than some of the other people, even Microsoft, especially Canonical. Uh, and so, you know, they have kind of a competitive advantage right there. Well, but this is a race for third, right? I mean, let's be let's be realistic here. This is not a race for second or even first. This is a race for third. Between this, the, you know, Android and iOS are are almost in a different class than BB10 in terms of market share, and within the next you know year and a half of realistically getting more market penetration, really the fight is BB10 and Windows 8. So then, I'm sorry, if, Windows Phone 8. If their best position is third, then I think the potential types of apps that can make money are a lot more limited. I think they're going to be the yep. big name apps and then they're going to be anything that's Business indie apps. is going to be, it's going to have to be extremely useful for the platform. Well, so like I've, actually like Nathan PCs there, I think maybe because he's in early, because it's a, it's a note taking, it syncs with Dropbox, which is business blowing up in business. I think Nathan PC, perfect example of an app that could do really well. But I think maybe something like, let's just say, uh, uh, well, let's just go with uh, Code Journal mobile on BlackBerry. I bet that would probably not do very well. Whereas it probably it would, would well. it could potentially do quite well on iOS or Android. You know, so it actually is doing fine on iOS. There is an iOS version. Okay, so there you go. Which I right? don't know if we've ever plugged on the show. Well, I yeah, I think you mentioned you were doing it, and then you never really followed oh, up. Oh, it's been out for about three months. All now right, so what does months. it do? So, so we should. It's it's totally free. I actually talked about it on a Ben oh. Morris's podcast. I it's it's totally free, um, which was an accident. Right. No, you did. You did talk about it a little bit. That's right. Right. And it has very limited advertising, but I'm not doing anything creepy. It's simply I ad. So I'm not like tracking you. I'm not doing anything. How's that you know? been working with that? The fill rates aren't where I'd like them to be. So I'll give you an example. For every 10 times the app is opened, I get like one ad. iPhone screenshots are not working on their page. You see that? 
Yeah, iTunes Connect has been messed up for three days. For me. So there are five screenshots. Apparently, they're only showing two, which is another news story we didn't cover. Apple has changed their screenshot policy, so I'm wondering if they don't, they move them. This is uh, looking nice, man. This is really nice. This is... Yeah, this is a little lower budget. Why are you, you know, not charging like a buck for this? Well, to be honest, the, the budget on my end was was virtually nothing. It's reusing a lot of the code from Code Journal. Whoa, really? It's using the older Code Journal assets that the great um, cheesy bacon made for me. So it's, you know, it was really a proof of concept that I showed to a few friends. And they're like, we want this. So but, that's a yeah. huge, you're, you're telling me you're able to reuse a ton of the desktop code to publish? I'd the, say it's approximately 90% the same code base. You got to give them that. That is incredibly yeah. impressive. Well, that's one of the advantages if you go native uh, Objective-C. I almost said C-sharp, Objective-C on uh, Mac and iOS. If you can reuse, all, if you do it correctly, you can reuse all your models and a good chunk of your controllers. And you just have to redo the views, which in the case of iOS are all, I've done them all interface builder. That's pretty cool. Well, way yeah. of the future. It's it's you know the app is I like it. It's free, and that's basically it. I mean, there's no I'm not asking for donations. There's no, you know, there's no upgrade. There's no premium membership. It's just free. So if you want it, download it and give it a five star review. Nice. Hey, can't beat the price. Just search for Code Journal. We well, you know what? Put a link to that in the show notes too. Put a link to that. Yeah, that's been out for a while. The, the sales. Surprisingly, the sales of the free app are much stronger than the sales of the paid app. Well, you know. Uh, now, now, what's the revenue difference, though, with the ad? Do you really see? Revenue is about the same. Really? Which isn't bad. I wonder then how it would do on Android. Now, that would be a pretty major undertaking, so, though, wouldn't it? I don't want to compete directly with GitHub. Oh, 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 that's they right. They have yeah. an official, uh, so not, they actually have an official GitHub issue app on iOS, but it's not purely the same thing on android they have a very nice that i use myself full featured github app and i i don't think it's right to use their developer tokens to compete with them directly yeah and you know and more importantly their app is open source and free yeah that's yeah it's gonna be hard so, to compete with that i mean i i would release probably a free version but why bother when anybody if they want to change something in the github app they can do a git pull change it and have their own <laughs> I get it. it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so I guess we've kind of slipped into the dev hoopla. You know, uh, yes. I think uh, we have a note in here to talk about uh, the Surface Pro. Yeah, so the, How many the, thoughts on this? Did this come out yet? I, I've been hearing about it everywhere. Can you buy it? Everybody. I don't know. I know it's in the hands of the reviewers. I got these the specs on it from uh, uh, well, basically every blog ever, including yeah. Zenet and... Uh, uh, Paul Throt, Super Sight, and all those uh, more Microsoft focused outlets. Right. Apparently, the battery life isn't too great. No. And it's not going to be a reasonable machine for developers. And it has a fan. So, as predicted, I don't like it. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's it's pretty underwhelming. Yeah. The other problem is the 64 gig. I think, as you've probably read, comes with only 24 gigabytes yeah. of usable space. And, and you know, to me, an even bigger problem is that it runs legacy applications. Really? That's kind of the point of it, though. Well, from a developer perspective, we really need to just deprecate that and move on and create a, create this new market. Hmm. We can build new software and sell it to people. Totally selfish thing, but remember, this is a developer show. Wouldn't you think, then, that this is just a transition device to transition people away from legacy apps? Because the legacy app experience is going to be probably pretty brutal on this thing. I feel like this is actually too big of a compromise. You know, I think it's... I mean, let, let's be real. You can run your Windows, uh, your Windows XP app still, and you can kind of run your Windows ninety eight apps if you really need to. I, you know, one thing they could have done is just not put a touchpad on the keyboard. No, I feel like it's more significant than that. I feel like Windows eight should have been and deprecated. We're done. That never, ever, ever would Microsoft do something like that ever. They're going to have to. They can't keep supporting these insecure code bases, these insecure applications, and these. Frankly, buggy applications, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these these things were written before we knew about threading. Mm -hmm. uh, these things were written before malware was a huge. Well, okay, it was a huge deal on XP. But I mean, you look at the you look at the footprint of that operating system, and it's pretty apparent there's a lot of legacy bloat there. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of almost ridiculous that you're spending that much money for a 64 gig device and only get 24 gigs of space. That is pretty bad. 
Yeah. Because I think like what Android and iOS take like a gigabyte. Yeah. I think I, yeah iOS is very little. I think Android might be less. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's it's small though. It's nothing major. So you know that's they they're obviously dealing with uh with a with a big legacy there. Yeah, and I th- you know I think they're just gonna have to eventually, you know they're gonna have to do it. Just say we can't support this forever. It's been a long time. They people. won't ever. And even after they switch away from Intel, they'll offer virtualization, and then you'll be able to virtualize it. Now, okay, let's back up. I, I want to maybe argue with your premise to begin with, because I think that maybe, you're right, they might have compromised too much, but I still think the standard, okay, here's the problem. Legacy applications, are it's going to be balls to use them on this thing. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be like when I tried to use Ubuntu on my Nexus 7, and it was totally non-optimized. It's not quite that bad, but it's going to be bad. It's not, but I think all that will do is result in people just not buying this thing. They're just going to buy laptops instead. Okay, and then what's the point of the product? That's the problem. It's just right. not enough to push it in any other way. However, I think they see it as a baby step device. Right, but look, I mean, let's let's focus it back to the developers. Schools could still find use for this, I suppose. Although the battery life is a little challenging for schools. Okay, that, that's great though. But from a you know most of our audience, there are developers. Many of them, as I've been finding out, are in, indie developers. As a Pyth- Pythoneer, wow, you're you're wearing that on your sleeve. Da, 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 da. Mentions in the chat room. Basically, yeah, I want a new market to exploit, right? I mean, and that's really what indie devs need because traditionally indie devs are the ones who take the risk on the smaller platform on the new platform, and when it goes well, it goes really well. But having this basically legacy crap around just undermines people's willingness to move on. I see. So they're they're preventing a, a, a full switch over to a new market where you they're can They're gimping a market and they're gimping the, uh, um, not what do they call it now, modern user interface, not Metro, right? right. Modern. Modern UI, yeah. By allowing people to go into this old interface okay. on tablet. All right. Okay. I mean, I, okay, I'm, I'm tracking. I'm tracking. Right. I guess I, yeah, I see what you're saying there. I mean, if you're, if you're going to move the platform forward and we're Maybe, not arguing yeah. whether modern ui is a good idea right now we're just saying if you're gonna move forward just do it yeah you know i think that actually though is the problem is i think a lot of people know that modern ui is not good enough yet yeah i like it having said that i do all my work in desktop mode so it's just too it's too basic i mean a windows machine has been a multi-window you know workhorse for a lot of businesses and people for so many right. years and metro is is like consumption mode. Well, so, you know, I don't want to hit this too hard. I do feel like modern UI and Windows should have been two separate products, right? So where iOS is based on OS X, but it's its own thing. It fundamentally comes down to a med- modern UI is is just another shell that's just running on top of Windows. It's not a, not a fundamentally different thing. It's just like when you launch Media Center. And that gets a little different when you're on WinRT though, right? Because some things don't exist on WinRT like they do on Win uh, yeah. Win 30, 3D6. I don't even know what they, they just call it standard Windows. That's, That's the other thing. If it's hard to name these things, right? Like if you're in a conversation and you're having a hard time figuring out what you're talking about, that's a branding problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been calling Windows a classic Windows. That's what they should call it. I like that. Like, like classic. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, a lot of people have been writing in very surprisingly enthusiastic about it for Jupiter Broadcasting. Really? One guy wanted to use it as a dev machine, which probably is not a great idea. I would say... Well, we all, want, we all have the dream, right? We have the dream of this super portable, super handy, you know, machine where you could bust it out. You have three or 4G connectivity... Um, and you know you can get some real work done real quick, and then you know fold it away, and it weighs three pounds at most and stuff. I mean, that really, who doesn't want that? Oh, and right, so the fundamental concept that this Metro UI is semi-synced across all your devices. So when you sit down at your Windows 8 workstation and you fire into Metro, yeah, you know you've so got. That's all, pretty neat. I like that. Right, all of that. That is such a great concept, but the problem is. Is Microsoft just just like everything they seem to launch, half executed? It's well, it's not, not that they half executed. They executed, 
but then they didn't close the door on the legacy crap. They didn't. They they couldn't close the deal, man. They couldn't commit. They couldn't bring it all well, the way. To well, the they're next... afraid. I mean, and it makes sense, right? Because every quarter since last quarter, OS ten has been gaining market much faster. See, it than... doesn't make too much sense because, at the end of the day, if they had gone just whole hog, just made the crazy ass leap, they'd still be making all their money off Windows seven, anyways. Because everybody's buying Windows 7 in the Volume business. licenses, yeah. Right. So it, it wouldn't matter because they would still make the same amount of money. Because I can promise you, I can promise you, all those Windows 8 sales that they're going through volume licenses, everybody's installing Windows 7. Because you're legally entitled to the next version down when you buy the latest version of a Windows license. That's how it works. So you always buy the latest, and then you install 7 or XP. So to be clear, that's with a volume license deal. If you go into the store and buy Win 8, I'm pretty sure you're not entitled to 7. Right. Yeah, I'm just talking volume licenses. Or, you know. And like OEM sales. OEMs are buying Windows 8, and then they're installing Windows 7. But let's, I mean, let's boil this down to its fundamental issue. This is an identity crisis, for lack of a better term, for Microsoft, right? They are, and I don't know if you followed their uh, their yearly reporting for their uh, revenue, they are a very strong, very powerful, very profitable enterprise company. But they really, really, really want to be a consumer company again. That's what it comes down to. Whereas BlackBerry is really, you know, it's funny. BlackBerry is kind of the same way, isn't it? They, they want. They, I hate to say it, and people are going to rage me. They all want to be Apple, and you know, Apple knows it can't be an enterprise player, right? They pulled XServe, which is probably a good idea, in all honesty. Yeah, but the X Raid was kind of cool. Right, but I mean, come on, how many people were running Apple servers? It's, yeah, it's I don't know. realistically. I don't know why you would do that, but I know people do. Yeah. I have no reason why you would. Yeah, this is a this is an issue of not focusing on your your core competency. Like BlackBerry, Microsoft, very strong, very powerful enterprise companies, with the exception, of course, that Microsoft has uh, the Xbox division, which does amazing. But they don't want to be. They want to be selling the trendy new gadget. Volumes are high. Well, I don't know why actually. I mean, you can get so rich being an enterprise company. Well, I mean, I I, I mean, there's. I mean, it's not really a topic for the show, but we could go into it, right? Like, Google Docs is incredibly dangerous for them because it's essentially free, although now there is that minor $5 charge per user, depending on when See, you... See, again, this is... I think what it is, is they're realizing going forward because electronics... Electronics used to be this weird thing that the business bought, but now they're becoming a consumer choice, and they're becoming trendy items. And so the tides have turned, and now it's bring your own device and they realize in order to get in the enterprise that's overblown there is still more money to be made in boring enterprise technology i agree, I yeah. agree. every serious business every serious large business still buys all their phones in mass they get a they get a great yeah. sweetheart deal with the telco and you know now maybe they're not buying those i don't know but you know yeah so yeah. i've been contracted to write custom mac applications because the it director was ordered by somebody with a c in his title that he wants to use a Macintosh and he needs a port of whatever their mission critical app is and doesn't want to run VMware. You know, whenever, uh, whenever yeah, and you... they won't buy a commercial version from the App Store because they're enterprise and they don't trust it. They want something custom that they can call me and say, "Hey, we're, we need an update to whatever." And that's honestly that's where a lot of the money in this industry is, and it's not pretty to cover from tech press because it's boring. But yeah. no one ever, I mean. It's very hard to go broke supporting the enterprise. I'll put it to you that way, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Chris, I'm sure you know this. Most of your clients are probably in very boring businesses. Mm-hmm. Well, just like mine, there's a handful of consumer-facing applications that I support. And the vast majority of them are internal enterprise-style applications. Yeah, things that, that we would never even run in, in, in anywhere else. Things you'd never see or hear yeah, of. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's just the reality of the market. And... You know, it's it's not like if Microsoft said, you know what, we're IBM, they'd be fine. IBM is doing fine. Oracle is doing fine, even though they're evil and Karma's getting them back in spades. It's it's I don't know. It's it's just so overblown. Yeah, I actually do agree with you. I think I think yeah. Microsoft. I think Microsoft, the way they have been uh, sort of structured now, leads them to be a very steady, reliable enterprise partner. You know, you can count on long support lifetime spans for their products. Uh, you can you can count on Patch Tuesday 
and you can work that into your routines. They have tools to manage large networks like Active Directory and Windows Update Services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they, you know, I think maybe through this process, as if Windows 8's a flop, and then the, I'm sure the fix that they're going to push out next year, or late later this year, to try to be like a service pack or kind of a thing, will probably be a flop. And maybe this will just sort of forcibly push them into the enterprise focus with, you know, their Xbox division still rocking it in its own little in little way and all, things like that. Right on. So we're actually going to skip the Rails story this week and save it oh. for next week because I think it could be a bigger topic. Okay. All right. All right. Well, do we want to talk a little X and A while we're on Microsoft? Yes. So wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. X and A has fallen and it can't get up. Uh, Microsoft has officially killed it via a email to one of their MVPs. It's like, if you don't know what that means, it's like developers they like and they give a special status to. That's like the most limp way to announce the death of something like this. It was kind of leaked. It wasn't supposed to be. So the way they did it is they emailed the MVP saying, hey, you're not going to be an MVP next year because we're not supporting XNA. Thank you. Oh. And the MVP got annoyed and leaked the email. I honestly, so, I know you've, I know you've been calling this since we started yeah. the show. Uh, I just... I thought this was Microsoft's secret weapon to take over the gaming industry. And I'm not kidding you. When I, as a Linux user, when they announced XNA, I thought, shite, it is over for Linux. Because the idea was, I thought you could write games for Windows and the Xbox 360 and then eventually Windows Phone and like write once, run on all three platforms. And I thought, who's not just going to do that? That's going to be super easy to publish for. And now here we are four or five years later or whatever it is. So this is... This has been dead, and you know anybody follow who follows Microsoft would know it's been dead. When Windows RT came out, and XNA was not supported at yeah, all. Yeah. Um, so there's good news and bad news here. Good news, XNA developers have a pretty clear path forward. And I actually wrote a blog post about this in Mono Game. Okay. Bad news: that path forward does not include the Xbox. Yeah. Which was one of the real attractions to using XNA. And will it? Will it? Will it include Windows Phone? I believe that's still in development, but yes, okay. I believe it does. I, I know it includes RT at this point. So that would be the good news. Okay. And, you know, the mono game community is very, very active, which is not surprising because, you know, I mean, this really was a great platform. And in a lot of ways, mono game has done a lot of improvements to XMA. And they've really taken it and made it their own and made it a lot better. However, what really concerns me is what does this mean for the Xbox 720? I'm calling it that. I don't care. I just have to name things with Microsoft. I just have to name them myself. Well, they're awful at it, so you might as well do it. What does this mean for Xbox Live Indie Games, which is uh, there, anybody can submit a game, Indie Channel, which was awful, and, and there's actually a great blog post you can Google around for, but why it's awful, or the real the real show, XBLA, which is where we have uh, Super Meat Boy, Fez, Braid, Limbo, basically all the big indie games anybody's talked about last year or the year before, they were big hits there. Because those two platforms were X and A only. Oh, yes. I have no idea. I'm... So I can tell you what they're pushing on this tablet side. Uh, they're pushing, and you can actually read on MSDN. If, I don't think you need to log in to do it. I think you could just go on the site. If you're doing a more casual type game, they're like, oh, just do it in HTML, JavaScript. You'll be fine. No. Obnoxious. Well, you could get away with a lot in JavaScript these days. I mean, but it's very different from XNA. Right? XNA was C sharp. XNA had a certain asset pipeline that was amazing. It really just isn't, uh, it's not really comparable. But what if your game is a little more in intense? This is what they're telling in developers. Well, DirectX is still around. DirectX? They're telling one two man studios to go ahead and dive into DirectX? And I mean, not that it's too hard, and not that one guy couldn't do it, or two guys, or two girls, or two guys, a girl in a pizza place couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But that's a whole lot more overhead than XNA, right? Yeah. One of the nice things about XNA is it was C sharp and it abstracted away a lot of that crud from you. 
And my second concern is, are they really going to allow indie developers on the next console to use DirectX directly? Haha, pun intended. Oh, interesting. They are kind of saying that in a way, aren't they? Are they? I think they are. I think I think that is what they're saying. My concern is that that's not what they're saying. Mm. And it's that they don't want to give outside indie developers access to that level of the hardware. Uh, for no, security reasons, you think, you uh, think no. they're going to let them do it? I hope you're right. Well, don't you think they'll just? Don't you just think they'll rigorously vet every app that does it? Well, they already do that, right? Right. So, uh, and and uh, think about it. If that would that, I, I think that's what they're going to do because Microsoft know already knows what they're going to do. So, if they're telling people this, they're essentially saying this is what we're going to be advising people. Just like how they, you know, they knew they're going to be phasing out XNA, so they didn't even bother with RT support. So you're saying that their advice currently for RT, we could just copy paste that for for XBLA seven twenty or whatever it's going to be called. I wonder. Yeah, I mean, oh, I think we can make some assumptions that the Xbox three hundred and sixty is going to be seven twenty. I can see the HTML thing, right? Because that's very low risk for them. I think we could say it's probably, it's going to support those. You know, those will probably be. Yeah. I wonder if that will be their avenue for indie games that aren't you know uh, scrutinized and charged and all of that. I wonder if that will be the. Well, actually, I, I think it's they're going to get... So, XBLA is the one that's charged and scrutinized. Xbox Live Indie Games is probably... I hope it goes away, to be honest. It was a very strange system. Um, and I've been involved in one or two games that ended up on it. The problem is, since it's totally community vetted, you get a lot of um, review kickbacks. So, And there was a great article written about this, uh, I think, a few months ago. You're very unlikely to... First of all, your competitors are deciding if your app gets into the store. It's not good. Second of all, if you do reject one of their apps, what's the next thing they're going to do? They're just going to go ahead and reject yours. And that was a huge problem. The end result ended up being that everybody just approved that proved everything for fear of getting their app rejected. Or their game rejected, I should say. So X, Xbox Live Indie Games is not a healthy market. And I think you do need the platform vendor to kind of control if there is an admission process, the admission process. Hmm. Um, and so my concern is only with XBLA. And also, you, you really think direct X access, huh? Well, why why are they dropping X and A? They won't say. Hmm. So this is also a, a larger shift towards C++ and a lot of their technologies too, right? Okay, yes. And I yeah. think... Let's just you know to to back up a little bit. If uh, if everything, I think the Xbox 720 will be much closer to a PC type device than the 360 is today, and I think that's going to factor into a bit of this. I bet they bring you. So the core of the Xbox 360 runs on a ported Windows 2000 operating system, right? Windows 2000. I think it's 2000. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Windows 2000 Pro, and uh, and this is what I was told by a guy who worked on the Xbox 360 project. I bet. The 720 is the same Windows Core that you know RT tablets are, or not RT the Pro tablets based off of Windows. You know it's it's going to be the true blue new modern version of the Windows Core, and it'll support a lot of the things that the devices have now that they're pushing people towards using. That's my that's my that's my theory. And you don't think the security implications of allowing. Um and just the stability implications of allowing indie developers to access DirectX will be a little bit too much for them. Don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, I just, like you said, it's if it's going to be a stability issue, then they probably won't do it. Right. My concern is that they might just kill XBLA wholesale, which it seems crazy, no right? Way. Nope, because there's it was no so way. successful. There's no, no way. Okay. No way, no way, because they have they. That is a huge division of the Xbox uh, group at Microsoft. They are they are a powerful part of that division. There's no way they cut them because the political structure isn't going to allow for it. They're too powerful as a group. So what do you think about this? Will XBLA become more liberal and who like more iOS I think, App Store, or will um, it stay strict? I think the dev the apps that are written in the safer languages, the little more you know, the with the more like like the HTML games, those. A little more free flowing. Interesting. So it'll be this bimodal marketplace. Different just like category. Yeah, there's going to be a lot games. more casual type stuff. 
Well, it'd be, it's interesting because right now I think XNA developers are, are grasping at what to do if they want to be on the next console. And watch that stuff be like more of the stuff that takes advantage of the Kinect too, I bet. Yeah, I think if they do open up this to indie games again, I think they're going to push the Connect, right? Because yeah, that's exactly. kind of their differentiating feature. And now they've got what a hundred and eighty dollar Connect developers kit you can put on your PC and write Connect apps, uh, you know, Connect based UI, whatever. I don't know how what the terminology is there, but uh, yeah. that seems like they're doing that so that way people can easily publish those on some on some system. Why else sell that kit? Because you can buy Connect for Windows right now. And do what? You develop apps for some console they're going to yeah, make that's going to make I it guess. easier for indie developers. Exactly. <laughs> that's the only reason to sell it, I think. All right, all right, all right. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah, I'd like to see this this go, you know, to a little more open marketplace. Yeah. Right now, there's been a, quite a lot of panic. Well, Microsoft needs to communicate better. They kill something, and they don't give their rationale, and people are like, and they're left in the lurch. And, well, you know, so a lot of folks in the know knew it was dead when it didn't come on Windows RT. Yeah, well, mm, mm, I don't know if I would totally agree with that assessment. I think, you know, people I, I, I people so, like you knew. New, that's that's the new baby. Like, they went out of their way to port it to Windows Phone 7. People like you knew, but companies sometimes are a little slower to, uh, you know, like companies maybe where they have a group right. of people writing these types of apps. I don't know. Uh, sure there's some up, I'm sure there's some upset folks. I'd love to hear from any XNA developers in the audience. How are you handling this? I, the ones I've talked to so far, like, we don't care. Reported to Mono Game. We're going to the iPad. Well, so, see, that, I think oh, that's Microsoft's, okay. that is Microsoft's hugest, hugest risk yeah. by not being clear what the path is, is people will freak out. And you and then you show me how you can write an app like you've done and, and, and easily publish it both to iOS and, and Android and, and the desktop. And, and it's just... Yep. I mean, I don't know. They're they're making they're taking a huge risk by not giving people a little bit of confidence in the direction of that. Um, but you know. So to be clear, uh, we'll Mono see. Game will not be a, will probably not go to the next Xbox, right? Since they said XNA is deprecated. Mm -hmm. So someone is asking in the chat. I really doubt uh, it, but you never know. Yeah, I, I would say if you're trying to develop for the console, if you have a contact, email him or her. See if they'll be willing to help you out under an NDA. If you, which I have no experience with, so I'm not saying that they will. I'm just saying that with the help, if you have contacts, you might as well use them, right? But like you said, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Other than that, wait. Right. No sense in investing in it. If, yeah. If you're sure you want to be on the next Xbox. Right. Um, and so if you're an XNA developer, let us know what you think. Coder Radio. Also, at Jupiter Sony Broadcast. might have something competing with XBLA. I would hope so. I think they have to. Yeah. The XBLA was too successful. To... All right. All right. I, all right. So, anyways, Coda Radio, jupiterbroadcasting.com. Let us know your thoughts, people. So, I have yet another tool this week. Oh. It's another Git tool because I, I'm leaving the command line a little bit. I don't know why. Uh, source tree is a GitHub, uh, a, sorry, a Git client. So just a source control client for the Mac that is totally free. Oh my god! Made by pretty. the good folks at Atlassian who make Bitbucket. Pretty. pretty. It really is pretty. Yeah, it's my Mac Git client of choice. Ooh, I like the UI a lot. Yeah. So uh, only went only for Mac? God, you're such only a tease. Gosh. Yes. Why don't they make this for other platforms, man? Even their website's really nice. <laughs> All right, so this is sourcetreeapp.com, and it's free for the Macintosh. The Macintosh, yes. Or the Mac. So, oh, you, one of those. Chris, you like Microsoft, right? Because I've been reading a great book. Uh, you know, this book is probably about the one thing I give Microsoft a ton of credit for, actually. Resolve and Fortitude, Microsoft's Secret Power Broker. It's, it's got like a spy title. It's got like I, I expect this to be written by Tom Clancy. I, yeah, you know, I mean, when I think of when I think of Microsoft getting into a market, one thing I always say is they're com they'll usually commit and they'll just keep moving forward until I mean, look what they did with the yeah. three, look what they did with the Xbox. They came into a Nintendo PlayStation market that was locked down. That PlayStation One sold so many consoles. And and so did the PS2. And now look, now they're kind of on top of the pile. And that's just because they well, have resolve. They really in, stick to in, it. In the U.S., right? It's a little different story in Asia. Oh, yes, yes. 
very true. But a lot of that, uh, there's some, been some interesting papers. So this just about. came out recently. Yeah, it's very new. It's um, by Microsoft's former OEM chief. Now, he draws some conclusions about what might be wrong with Microsoft today that I will let you read for yourself and not spoil for you. Oh. Um, they are conclusions held by lots of, um, let's say, Microsoft tech blockers and enthusiasts that don't work for Microsoft. They te- seem to blame one or two people or one person in particular. Do you feel like it's giving you a little insight on how the company works or how they come to Kind of, but I feel like the author has an ax to grind too. Like even in the by the fifth chapter, you can tell he has a personal conflict with someone very important. That just festers. Huh. Yeah, and I think it should be fairly obvious who that person would be. So uh, it's uh, $9.39 uh, $9. if you get it uh, the f- for the Kindle. We'll have a link in the show notes. If you buy that, it supports the show. And just a reminder, yeah. we have affiliate links uh, at the bottom of the Jupiter Broadcasting site. If you click there before you shop for Amazon or Best Buy or ThinkGeek or something like that, maybe Newegg, uh, that also supports the network and the show. That's, that actually sounds, I'm kind of, I think, you know, for nine bucks, I think I will pick that up just because. Oh, it's pretty good. It's um interesting how they approached OEM sales in the beginning before they were more monitored, shall we say. Uh, basically, everybody had a different deal. Oh, really? So if you, Compaq and, H, you know, Compaq and HP and, you know, Joe Blow Computer Company all had different deals. <laughs> And it was all about, there was a company called DRI. How can we screw DRI out of this market? Like, there was a whole guy's thing. is like, how low does this price have to go to make sure you don't buy from DRI? All right. They played dirty. Well, is it dirty? I mean, that's what happens on the app stores now. I guess so. Good old capitalism. Good old VC-backed apps. Clone a paid app and release it for free. Hmm. Not that I'm full of hatred. No, no. No. Well, I know, uh, I know that we have uh, so many more good topics to get to this week, but I think yes, tune in next week for the Rails apocalypse. Ooh, the Rails apocalypse, and maybe uh, you know, maybe we'll cover a little uncertainty of things too. But uh, Mr. Dominic, where can people follow you throughout the week? Come find me at Twitter at Dumanuko. Oh, very nice. Nice and short. Also, he's blogging, and yeah. uh, he might even occasionally, but not often, visit Google Plus. We have links to those in the show notes as well as links to my profile. Don't forget to join us live Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, over at jblive.tv or jblive.info for the audio, or download us Monday afternoons. And uh, thank you to everyone who uh, rates and comments in iTunes. We don't have a lot of you out there who do it, but those of you who use iTunes, it helps other people discover the show, which is a great and quick way to support our little podcast. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of Coda Radio. See you right back here next week. <laughs>